Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 788. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 7th, 2023. All right, glad you could join us for another episode. Exciting episode. I'm going to say that right up front because I got to see the notes of Anglican Unscripted. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff here in the Church of England because, well, it's messed up. Before we get there, uh, George gets to take his dogs to work every day. That's kind of nice. And I have my cats with me. You know, it's kind of with the operations we have with Anglican TV. You can take your animals to work day. But I hear a dog snoring in the background. Is that my earphone or is that your dog? No, no, no. That's Julius. He snores. He has a... Uh, uh... <laughs> you just heard that one. <laughs> yeah. He snores. And I have to say, Kevin, I take the dogs to the office because I walk them before the before I come in. And on Sunday right. morning at 6.30, I got here early with the dogs. Uh, they don't come to church. They stay in the office or they come out and join Sunday school if their kids are outside. But mm-hmm. got here early and two of the dogs are well-trained, Julius and Jasper. Cosmo's still a puppy. And I always hook up Cosmo before we get out of the car, but I was a little slow. And so at 6.45 on Sunday morning, he shoots out of the car and I run after him. The two dogs follow me, and he decides we decide we're going to run around the church outside. And he stops in front of the front door, and he does a big dump. And then he smiles at me, and I'm just about to catch him when he moves again. And we had a good half hour playtime. So when I started the services at eight o'clock, I was you know, Satan has infested my dog. <laughs> yes, I mean, dog, I was just yes. in a miserable mood, <laughs> exhausted, sweaty. Uh, wanted to strangle the dog, but you know, I'm a nice puppy. I have, no. we have a monitor. Peace be with you. Yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, they either dogs either raise my blood pressure or lower my blood pressure. It depends how obedient they are. No, no, With their snoring in the background, that makes me calm. Well, our, our cats are very uh, fun as well, but uh, they love to chew Jill's flip flop. And uh, every afternoon when she gets off her computer, she walks back in bed and thoughts up. You can hear how angry she gets. And as long as the anger is directed toward the cats and not me, I'm good with that. No, no mm-hmm. big deal. You, you want a cat, you got cats. And that's what cats love to do. Let's move on to the news. But before we get there, please like this episode, share this episode, comment on this episode. Got lots of comments on our last show, George. I don't know if you got to read them all. So we appreciate that. We read them all. We try to comment on the ones that are appropriate. So please thank you for doing that. On to the show notes here. Um, uh, We're actually going to report on an Orthodox story. Uh, Karel, who is with the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, was reported to be a KGB spy, according to Swiss intelligence. Kind of an offbeat story for Anglican Unscripted, but we talked about Krell a lot uh, in his workings with Putin, certainly. Yes, the Times of London has a front page story today saying that Swiss intelligence has declassified documents from the 1970s. And at that time, Carroll was the Russian Orthodox Church's envoy to the World Council of Churches, and he worked for the WCC in Switzerland. And Swiss intelligence identified him as a KGB asset, an agent of influence who sought to shape the WCC's agenda against the West uh, on issues from Zimbabwe to, uh, do you remember the neutron bomb? And uh, I do. <laughs> the whole big thing of putting cruise missiles in Europe. Uh-huh. Well, Kirill worked for the, Kirill was active with the KGB in making sure that Western popular opinion turned against Ronald Reagan and company so that we wouldn't put cruise missiles in Europe. Now, this is almost like a, a uh, dog bites man story, because if this is true, and Carol of uh, the Russian church has denied this as being an outrageous slam. No, sure. That's horrible. This, this, essentially, every patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church since the early 20s has been a KGB agent. Oh, easily, easily, you know, from Stalin on, or Lenin on. Lenin on, and uh, his, and so part, but where the Times takes this, and I don't know if it's, if it's a fair thing, is that uh, why does Kirill back Putin 
another former KGB agent in the war in the Ukraine. Well, does Putin have something on Kirill? He probably does. They oh, have something have on to. everybody. Come but on. I yeah. still think Kirill believes what he says about this being a holy war against the West. Yeah. So, to, so is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church a former KGB asset? The Swiss say so. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it should not be surprising. I mean, uh, there's a famous photograph of uh, Ronald Reagan visiting a German country. It was West Germany at the time. And a 21-year-old KGB agent named uh, uh, Putin was standing right next to him. Uh, and I'll, I'll try and put that up here if I can, if I can find it. And KGB was your, your way forward in the Soviet Union. You didn't want to be a person who was spied on. You wanted to be a spy. And we don't have time to, to go into how communism works here. But uh, it, it, it's... <laughs> It's telling your neighbor is is the the best of the government here. All right, let's move on. Uh, Tanzania has a primate election next week. Uh, there are three candidates, and we've been getting information on all three. Uh, surprisingly, no. But the Episcopal Church uh, is trying to uh, have active ministries in Tanzania, but that money is going towards the vote, George. <sighs> Yeah, it's Tanzania newspapers. We've Tanzania has always been a well, a dirty province where money talks and votes are purchased. Um, and the first Gafcon primate from Tanzania, Valentina Mokiwa, was later kicked out of the church for corruption, and it was a fair charge. Well, there's going to be an election. The primate Imendola, Archbishop Imendola, his five-year term ends. Uh, next week and he's eligible for one more five-year term and he's got two challengers one an evangelical uh from the north and one an anglo-catholic from the coast and the tanzanian press is making allegations that the evangelical candidate stanley hote who is also the gafcon candidate has been bought by gay money from the u.s uh father marek zabriskie who was the rector of Christ Church in Greenwich, Connecticut, took a bunch of people to Mount Kilimanjaro Diocese, raised money to support the ministries of Stanley Hote's diocese, and have forged links with Stanley. And the newspaper claims uh, uh, that uh, Stanley... Let's say this is above board. This is not trying to buy votes. This is a, a wonderful ministry from the Episcopal Church trying to have uh, godly influence in the country. Unlike and uh, and for, on the parish level, yeah. and Christ Church, of course, is the wealthiest parish in Connecticut. It's uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's a really right. nice place. Mm -hmm. And but then the Tanzanian press then says Stanley then turned around and has been using the money for orphans and for this and that to buy votes among the other bishops. So he's elected. Now, is any of this true? I don't know. Uh, we're just repeating what has been said in the Tanzanian newspapers, but it is not uh, out of the realm of possibility given the track record of the church in Tanzania where the you've basically got three factions. You have the Gogo tribe, which mm -hmm. is sort of in the middle of the country. You have the Anglo-Catholics on the coast and the evan evangelicals in the north and uh, west. And Tanzania has wanted to split into three provinces, a tribal province for the Gogo tribe, which Archbishop Mandola is part of, a northern evangelical portion, and a coastal Anglo-Catholics. And they've held together, but whenever we have the elections, it's always a balancing act between the three. Mokiwa was an Anglo-Catholic from the coast. Um, and Mandola was a... I think, I, think, I think he was is a member of the Gogo tribe from the center of the country. And you just, however, and money usually changed hands to affect the election. In fact, Kevin, do you remember a few years ago, we reported about how one bishop was so angry, one diocese was delegation enough. was so angry <laughs> yeah. that, that they weren't getting the same amount of money for their votes. Mm -hmm. And they complained publicly about that as mm -hmm. another diocese. Uh, and it was so, a lot of money, too. I think the number that made the press was like $20,000. How come they got $20,000 and we didn't? Like, well, yeah. Yeah. corruption. Yeah. Yeah. 
So <sighs> pray for the church in Tanzania that uh, out of all this manure, something shiny can arise. Um, well, I, I not a good situation. No, it's not. I, I one of the quotes I saw was only in Tanzania would the uh, uh, pro GAFCON candidate uh, be uh, pro gay. <laughs> just like <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know. <sighs> All right, well, let's move oh, on to Pakistan. Uh, in the Pakistan, I think the Lahore diocese is the biggest diocese, and uh, we're. We reported last week about some of the corruption. Let's uh, finish up and talk a little bit more about that. But just like Tanzania, money is exchanging hands. And what we, we always hoped one day would Pakistan would be pro Gafghan. Um, they're kind of still in the Welby camp. Yeah. Uh, Humphrey Peters, who turns 70, is the Bishop of Peshawar, former, prime, former moderator of the Church of Pakistan, current Bishop of Peshawar. Mm -hmm. The rules say that you have to retire at 70. He was able to get a rump meeting of the standing committee of the Church of Pakistan to extend the retirement age to 72. Well, another meeting of the standing committee undid that. Lawsuits have followed. Meanwhile, Lahore, which is the wealthiest diocese, has a lot of property left over from the British Empire, the Raj. Um, instead of following the procedures, uh, for electing a bishop set down by the National Church Constitution. They did it their way and had three retired bishops come and lay hands on the elected bishop of Pakistan of Lahore. Now, what we have now is a situation where you've got four pro gafgan and four, four pro Welby parrot dioceses, and they're sort of stuck because they can run it through the Pakistani legal system, which will take 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So they reached out to Justin Welby to uh, mediate the dispute. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means in the short term, I don't see Pakistan fully endorsing the GAFCON agenda if they are relying on Justin Welby to clean up their own mess. Oh, well. he's busy. And, and see, he's here's busy. The thing. He's busy this week. Theologically, they these guys theologically are all on the same plane. Yeah, it's just that uh, some are willing to stand and fight against the influence of the U.S. and England. And that's the pro Afghan faction. While others are saying we'll take their money and make nice, but then do what we're going to do anyway. So it's not like you're getting a pro gay church in Pakistan. Rather, there's oh. some just taking the money. And voting Welby's way in the ACC and the primates meeting, while others are saying we need to take a stand against Welby. And now Welby's been asked to come in and be referee this whole mess. All right, let's move on to our next story. One of the hot topic issues uh, on Anglican Scripted is uh, women's orders. George and I never want to give our opinion because it would divide the audience and it would just shut down the comment section. Okay, everybody would go there to tell us how we're right or how we're wrong. So we just, we back off. That's not where we're going to go. Uh, the second most hot topic issue we ever talk about is seminaries. Because we don't always mention all the seminaries. There is a list of Anglican seminaries, I know. And so when we we're talking about seminaries last week, and I was just rattling off like three or four, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I left out 12, 13, or 14, and I apologize. It wasn't the topic uh, last week. Last week's topic was the dwindling Episcopal seminaries. This week's topic is a think tank at the Virginia Theological Seminary, where they come up with ideas, and boy, they get a doozy, George. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they've he? got a they've got a think tank run by a priest named Lorenzo Labrija, who's from mm -hmm. the diet, who was from Los Angeles, but he's currently now uh, canonically resident in San Diego. They come up with all sorts of uh, they like to call themselves what is it now Generation Z or whatever the young some of that yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. things yeah, to sort gener of reach generation them. it's Generation Me. They're the heatedest, okay. Things to reach the newer generations using mm -hmm. social media and various things, and also big into Hispanic ministry and this and that. Well, they've had a project in the works for about a year and a half now, and it's finally kicked off. Now, I can say the Episcopal Church doesn't have a good record in 
Saving Souls, but it probably now has the best church brand tequila you will find in America. What? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Blessed tequila. Sanctus Aquam, it's called. Holy water is... Uh, you know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Jesus blessed tequila, <laughs> isn't it fine? Oh boy! Uh, they, uh, <laughs> this project uh, uh, was uh, Sanctus Aquam is uh, distilled in Jalisco, Mexico, and sold mm -hmm. in the U.S. And the proceeds under the brand Blessed the Tequila. And there's okay. a whole media campaign with all these churchy imageries. Uh, you know, uh, the tequila for sinners and saints and this and that. And the, the proceeds are being used to fund ministries in San Diego diocese along the border for the refugees and the sort of cross-border communities. And there's a big problem, of course, with all these people on the borders trying to get in. And so this can be an object of fun, but, you know, it's not that bad of an idea. It's This guy's clever. He's an entrepreneur. Mm, uh, really? Uh, now I, I, I as don't an drink, so I don't know if it's... Yeah, uh, I'm going to try it. I don't. In, in fact, if the what's his name? Lorenzo Labrija. Lorenzo. Lorenzo Labrija. If you could go to Anglican dot Inc. And on the right-hand side, there is the address of Anglican TV. If you would send us a bottle, we would gladly uh, review it on our program for you. Um, because you can't, I, do you want you, a bottle or a case? What is easier? Just to... Bottle, because it may not be good. Oh. <laughs> you don't want to oh, okay. haul around a case all over the country. In fact, just a pint. I don't need a lot. What, whatever your smallest bottle is, I will taste it, and I will review it for our uh uh, international viewership, and uh, we'll see if we can have a little fun with that. Well, but it, that's crazy, it, George. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And to be fair, we've made fun of some English cathedrals who brought out their own brands of gin to se mm -hmm. sell in the cathedral gift shop. I myself don't drink. I'll have the occasional glass of beer, of course, maybe once every six weeks or a month or something. But I'm not an alcohol drinker. I don't drink hard spirits. And mm -hmm. I know I know many of our uh, African viewers are quite strict in their ideas on alcohol consumption. Sure. So it's it's a controversial topic. It really is within the Anglican world. Now, Americans may not think so. They may think, "What the Episcopal what? Church? What? That's synonymous with uh, gin and tonics." No, well, alcohol which is, uh, is that's a big issue in the developing world in the Anglican world. I was in a West African country attending or filming a consecration of a bishop and i could tell you which one because i don't want anybody to get in trouble here and we were when we arrived given a sheet of paper of things we should you know probably not do as americans or westerners one of them was go to the bar at the hotel and drink so at 9 p.m that night i am at the bar with an american bishop uh and we're drinking a little scotch if you know and it it's 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 american were we getting drunk no it was kind of an end of the evening little nightcap we as the westerners do that but you know he knew the rules he he read them but you know it's just part of, i gotta have it, my my one shot and he had one shot i had one shot before bedtime and that was just it <laughs> but he knew the rules because <laughs> we talked about them so yeah it, it, it is what it is george Let's move on to some more. Oh. Next story. He's not my Pope, but Pope Francis, who is famous for uh, um, giving an AP interview two weeks ago where he said uh, gay is not a crime or homosexuality is not a crime, but it is a sin, has gone now and uh, laid out another great quote where he says prophetic ministry is not a political ministry. Well, that's interesting, George. Francis is the slingshot pope. He just shoots yeah. you from one side to the <laughs> spectrum to the other. And yeah. here's something that I agree totally with Francis on. I'm right on with this, yes. Francis yeah. addressed the gathering of the Congolese bishops in Kinshasa uh, last week when he was there before he went to South Sudan with Justin Welby. And the text of his sermon was just released. And what he said was that when the church is being prophetic, that is not political activism. The church has no business being politically activist. It must be personal activism 
personally out living a life that is obedient and faithful to Christ. That is a prophetic ministry, a, a Christ-filled ministry, not standing for this or that or the other. Now, what Francis just did was slit the throats of all these activist nuns or Father James Martin and all these people in the U.S. and around the world. Who Michael are Curry. Political. Michael yeah. Curry, Curry, all this and that. He but, just basically undercut their whole reason for being in the ministry, which is to be political activists. For Francis saying no, or maybe it just applies to the Congo, I don't know. But a political, a prophetic ministry is a Christ-centered, Christ-filled ministry, not a ministry of ideology or ideas or action. I'm of a certain age. And I can't tell you how many ministers I know who are just a little older than me who went into the ministry to avoid the Vietnam War. I can't tell you how many ministers I know uh, who went into ministry because they thought it was just a better version of social work. You know, so it, it, I and I can tell you I know a lot of uh, people who went into ministry for the right reason. They they felt called. Uh, mm -hmm. So this kind of, you know, if you went into ministry to be a social worker, this is, this is what Pope Francis is talking about. Yet, if I can remember the last six years of Pope Francis, he's been politically active, George. He's yes, chosen he winners. <laughs> he's chosen losers. <laughs> he doesn't like the mean tweeter. He, uh, you know, and so he is politically active. So I don't know what, if, if he can't find himself in what he, did, he just preached about. Well, this is why it's so maddening at times. Yeah. It's so wonderful for the press because Francis is all over the place. That's right, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, there's no internal... Well, there may be consistency, according to Francis's more, mind view, of basically playing to an audience, uh, which is what Welby does. Welby yeah. will say one thing to liberals, one thing to conservatives. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you remember when uh, we were in, in Nairobi and uh, Welby addressed the GAFCON primates who were <laughs> gathered there? And First all and the second promises, serving, yeah. <laughs> all the things, all the things he said, and um, yeah. and he just was on spot. And then he'll go back to the UK and stand before uh, you know a gay audience or a uh, liberal college audience, and he'll basically say the opposite. Well, B is a man whose message is tailored for his audience, and there is a con but there is an internal consistency for Welby. It is that he wants everybody to be happy and to like it. Well, it, I don't think Welby knows what unity means in the kingdom. I think he understands mm -hmm. secular unity and his his early life as a Christian and his life as a working in the oil industry, whatever. He has a clear idea of what unity means to him, but I don't think he has the biblical definition of unity or certainly the kingdom definition of unity. And that's what we're seeing here and we'll be talking about here in a minute. And I think it kind of relates to our next story. Uh, the ACC is having a meeting, I think, in Ghana next week. And that's yes. one of the uh, instruments of unity. Uh, we know that the instruments, for people new to the show, Anglicans have an unofficial leadership. It starts with the Sea of Canterbury. It moves on to Lambeth. It includes the ACC meeting and it includes something else, an office of something. Primates. What's, primates primates Council. Yep. Primates Council. Those are the instruments of unity. One of them is meeting in Ghana and they somebody... I don't know, it's not them, but somebody attending this meeting has released a paper, the International Anglican Standing Commission of Unity, Faith, and Order, ha we call them UFO, has released a paper, George, and somebody at the head office did not approve this paper. There's no way. Yeah, the UFO Commission released a paper on trying to find a theological way forward on the divisions over human sexuality within the Anglican world. And uh, they didn't say the to find a way forward because it's unifying. They said it's no, divisive. No, they, well, they basically did say, you know, Rowan Williams' idea of an Anglican covenant was a good idea, but that blew up. Mm -hmm. So now, because that's you can't put that genie back in the bottle, we need to find to have a way for differentiation among the provinces. Right now, we have provinces in and out of communion with each other, partial communion. Um, 
like in the West, like I ha I hold a license from the Bishop of Northeastern Caribbean. Uh, the the province of the West Indies is out of communion with the Episcopal Church of the United States, yet is in communion with me because I'm from the Diocese of Florida and they know I'm I'm safe. Well, the there needs to be a way for differentiation, structural differentiation, so that we can all be parts of the Anglican communion, from uh, Lagos to uh, Greenwich Village. But we need to have clear structures that uh, allow people to basically say, I am here, but I am not there. Now, this is entirely reasonable and rational, and they're putting forward some theological arguments how to do this to may have both Welby's idea of unity, but at the same time have theological integrity. They're trying to sort of thread that very tiny needle there. This is what the Church of England Evangelical Council wants in the Church of England. If Synod goes over, off the cliff and has gay blessings and gay marriage, the Church of England Evangelical Council wants a differentiation so a new parallel province or structure or something so that I, a conservative evangelical or Anglo-Catholic or even middle of the roader who will not uh, accept this new innovation, I need to be able to be differentiated from those who do structurally, not just, well, uh, not just by word of mouth, but people know I'm in column A or column B. <laughs> And he, he, here's, let me give you an example of that. When I was an Episcopalian in the late 80s, it was a, a proud brand. The brand was not ruined. Okay. Uh, I would say I went to an Episcopal church and I would not roll my eyes or say not that type of Episcopal church. I could say I went to the Episcopal church and it, it meant something. Now, if you say you went to you go to the Episcopal Church, you have to explain that I don't go to that type of Episcopal Church. I go to this type of Episcopal Church. There's a division. There's multiple divisions in the Episcopal Church. And so you have to explain what you mean when you say Episcopal. Justin Welby and the current leadership of the Anglican Communion have ruined that brand. Now when you say I'm an Anglican, I, and I have to do this, I run Anglican TV, and I, st I have to tell people not that kind of Anglican. I'm not, you know, well, what's an Anglican? Well, in, in America, it means the Episcopal or the ACNA, and I have to dif differentiate what an Anglican believes because the leadership of the Anglican Communion has ruined the brand. People now, they, they don't trust Anglican anymore. And this is what they're talking about with the International Commission, Anglican Standing Commission of Unity, Faith, and Order, the brand has been ruined. How do we identify ourselves within Anglicanism now, George? Read the paper, which we've republished on uh, Anglican Inc., and you mm -hmm. can see it's an addition, It's a starting point for this discussion. It's not a conclusion. So a lot more work needs to be done. And I am fairly confident that Justin Welby will try to neuter this because it's the same path that conservatives in England are demanding how can we have it on a communion level, but not on a provincial level? Yeah, and there's there's clearly Justin Welby and the leadership there have ruined the Church of England. You know, thirty that, years that, ago. That, yeah, thirty years ago, I remember John Howe. Twenty, no, no, thirty, twenty years ago, yeah. I remember John Howe and uh, other bishops, uh, Bob Duncan, before things really went bad, saying in the Episcopal Church we have uh, nine or ten provinces. Uh, we need to create another non-geographic, and they're geographic, the Southeast, right. the Mid-Atlantic, yep. the Northeast, uh, Caribbean. We need to create another province for like-minded, you know, clergy who are not drinking the Kool-Aid out of New York. That was shut down because the, they didn't want to. Uh, so every time it's been proposed, the only time it's ever worked is when it was done on race in New Zealand. They split the church between a white church and a Maori church, a Paheka mm -hmm. church, as they like right. to call yeah. it, and a yeah. Maori church. And, you know, in the United States, that was viewed with great displeasure because that was essentially saying we're going to have separate but equal uh, provinces for people of different colors. And in America's history, you can't say that. Uh, no, you can't. Separate but it, schools, it's also saying separate equal churches. But back to unity. When you want to have something separate, you're giving up on unity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, here, I, I don't 
think people understand you can't put the genie back in the bottle, as you say, and regain unity when you're trying to save the brand name. Mm-hmm. Or, or where do I find myself in this? Uh, Justin Welby's actions have clearly demonstrated another tear in the fabric of the Anglican communion where Mm -hmm. uh, Gene Robinson tore it one way. uh, Justin Welby has torn it another way and all seeking some secular compromise with uh, culture. Not going to work. All right, George, let's move on to, this is not the, yeah, this is the last story, I think, no, second to last story. No, no, uh, no, we're to ta- I got Church of England here. You want to talk about that? Oh, yeah, well, there's several Church of England stories, yes. Yeah, I got all, oh, you, you poor people, you don't know what we have to talk about here, but last week we reported on uh, Sam Margrave, and he uh, was having a bit of trouble with the Church of England. Surprise, surprise, surprise. This week, Sam Margrave gets a letter from uh, Archbishop Justin Welby, co-signed with uh, Archbishop York Contrell, and they basically bully him and said, you know, these questions you've been asking are out of order. You're, can you please apologize for these mean tweets? Uh, basically, the leadership in the Church of England thinks Sam Margrave, a, a layperson, is the mean tweeter. He's Trump. Sam Margrave is a lay delegate to General Synod from the Diocese of Coventry. And he held, he, when he was elected, he received the most votes of any lay delegate. So he essentially has legitimacy uh, from the voters of the Synod of Coventry uh, behind him. Well, Sam Margrave, who is a bit of a gadfly, he's not rude, he's not vitriolic, he just asks awkward questions and points out when the emperor has no clothes on. He received, and he's been doing this for a while, he's pointed out the inconsistency between having Jane Ozan, one of the leaders of the gay movement in England, Church of England, a member of General Synod, drawing her salary from the lobbying group that she runs. You know, there's a financial incentive, financial interest here that you really need to disclose and not try to hide that. Or pointing out that Peter Tatchell, the uh, gay activist, Recent, you know, up until recently, he had on his website his support for removing the ages of consent so that adult men could have sex with little boys if a little boy was willing. Now that's gone now from Tatchell's website, but that you know, the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive, <laughs> you can find it. Yeah. And because of these things, because of telling the truth, people like Jane Ozan have gone into hysterics. Now, whether she's a narcissist or hysteric, I don't know. I'm not going to diagnose her from afar. No, that's not that our job. But two, Monday, but two Mondays ago, she and Tatchell and a group of about 40 other gay activists were outside Lambeth Palace on a Monday night protesting, and Welby came out to assuage their anger, and he promised to crack down on clergy who are preaching things that are offensive to the gay community. Well... Welby's first victim of this crackdown is not a priest, but a lay delegate to synod. So a joint letter from the two archbishops demanding that he apologize and be a good boy and not be so mean and not say that the Church of England's plan to bless gay blessings uh, is, is sinful, even though the bishops say it not sinful. So, no. We posted a copy of this letter, which we received from Mr. Margrave on Anglican Inc. And essentially, this shows up the silliness of Justin Welby in so many ways, because he's the one who's been making this great big campaign against bullying, and all are welcome, and we all must treat each other with respect, except if they disagree with us and point out what fools we've been. And which was the theme of Welby's presidential address to Synod. But mm-hmm. here's the thing. Well, let Sam Margrave is a layman. The Welby can do nothing to him. Nothing. He can't repel him from Holy Communion. That's the parish priest's job. Uh, Welby can't kick him out of Synod because all of the things Sam Margrave... And Welby hasn't specified what exactly you did wrong, or this tweet is the one that I dislike. None of these things that allegedly took place occurred at synod and so welby as president of synod 
can't kick out Sam Margrave unless there's an act that has two thirds majority of the Senate saying, yes, that deserves censure. But even then it's censure, you can't kick him out. So Welby's threats are hollow and meaningless and point up the hypocrisy of his calls for unity, 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 save for those uh, awkward people who just make me look foolish. Well, I agree that the, you know, Justin Welby's complaints here are hollow, but they're not meaningless because it's stopping other people from standing up. There are other conservative sure. members of the Senate and moderate members of the Senate who see how Sam is being treated by righteous clergy uh, and say, uh, maybe I'm not going to raise my hand and ask a question. How is this not divisive? Maybe I'm not going to, uh, because Sam Margraven, we put in our article, has asked deliberate questions of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, do you have those in front of you? Well, one question he asked yesterday mm -hmm. uh, on this whole uh, hate speech, hate crime stuff, where you say things that people find offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Margrave pointed out that a great number of Muslim students ch attend Church of England schools. How would the Church of England respond to claims that telling Muslims that uh, Jesus uh, is the Son of God, which is f forbidden in Islam, yes, how yes. would that would that be a hate crime? And Welby said, well, that's an out-of-order question, refused to answer it. So, you know, Welby is uh, means rather foolish, I think, but well, that, that was just yesterday. That was just yeah. yesterday, Monday. Uh, that's, that's not the issue because, well, Margrave already got the letter in the mail by the time he asked those awkward questions. So it's... Uh, it's crazy, it's but the, the, the well. Hold on. The good thing here is Sam is not stepping down; he's not backing mm -hmm. away. He's going to continue because it's his duty to, uh, when mm -hmm. confronted by uh, heresy and apostasy, to confront it. And that's not just at a clergy level. Uh, I do it all the time as a layperson. I'm glad Sam's doing it as a layperson. You had to say no. That's not right. And here's why it's not right. Yeah. So good for Sam. Yeah, Sam is going to be tabling amendments to the uh, art, the Living and Love and Faith resolution, which basically uh, block what the bishops want to do. Uh, he'll basically table amendments saying uh, the Church of England upholds the the receives uh, Canon B thirty, which is holy matrimony, the canon in the Church of England. Uh, Sam is going to be putting forward amendments, basically saying we affirm this. We don't add something to it with this gay blessing, which is not holy matrimony, all that. You know, basically, so Sam is, Sam is taking the fight to the enemy. And well, and this all was going to happen on Wednesday. And whether he's successful or not, I don't know. Um, God's in charge. Uh, so we'll soon see how, uh, and his ways are non unknoble to us at times. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, Cottrell was asked, if a clergy person no longer believes in the doctrine of the Church of England, should they resign? And his answer, if George? If a bishop. Oh, he said if bishop? A bishop. Well, none of them were. a okay. bishop can okay. no, no longer uphold, believes or upholds the doctrine of the Church of England, should he not in good conscience resign? And Cottrell said, no, of course not. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't need faith then, to be a bishop. And then... And then Cottrell, who is not the sharpest knife in the drawer in that College of Bishops, he's not a theologian. No. He no. went on to cite John Henry Newman's doctrine of development, that doctrine doesn't change, it just develops over the course of time as we get a deeper understanding of the Christian faith through our lived experiences. I hate that phrase. Uh, lived I That's horrible. By the way. <laughs> I can't. And so, and that gay marriage is a development of doctrine which Sarah Mullally, in her speech on the living and love and process, uh, living and love and faith process, essentially said the same thing, that God is doing a new thing here. And that some members of the Church of England are being faithful to that new thing, which is gay marriage. And we need to respect that. So Stephen well, Cottrell is being not heretical. He's not denying the divinity of Christ. He's being heterodox. He is teaching a doctrine at odds with scripture and 
the revelation of Jesus Christ as made known to us, the traditions of the church, and the universal mind of the Christian faith until about 20 years ago, um, 25 well, years ago. I would ask the opposite question. Uh, Kurtal was asked if a bishop no longer believes in the doctrine uh, of the Church of England, should they resign? My question is, should a clergy person who does believe in the doctrine uh, of the Church of England leave? Because th they're being shown the door here, George. Well, when Cottrell was Bishop of Chelmsford, which is uh, East London and the Sussex area and all that, mm -hmm. uh, at a clergy conference, he conservatives said, you know, what should we do if we disagree with you, if we disagree with this new way that you're pushing of gay marriage and full inclusion? And Cottrell said, leave. Yeah. Cottrell's telling the traditionalists to leave when he was in Chelmsford. Now, he was... Uh, he was uh, uh, he tried to defend this later by saying, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, no, 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 no. Everybody's welcome. Uh, but it was quite clear that uh, if you're not on board in Chelmsford, get out, leave. Leave the diocese, leave the ministry, whatever it is, but don't stand in the way of progress, was Cottrell's line. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think we mentioned, we've been talking to people who are at Synod and have been at Synod, just like at general conventions or at general councils, there are groups that meet on the side, like-minded people. And we've been talking to some people who've been tending these groups. Essentially, they started last night. And I can sort of give you a snapshot without naming names of the impressions I got from talking to these people. There are people who think like Kevin do. Uh, should I get out? And that's basically taking the form of, we need to have an up or down vote on B30, the marriage canon. Do we affirm it? Do we reject it? None of this halfway nonsense of gay blessings are not marriage. Then there are others who basically support the traditional view of marriage, who are saying, now it's not the time to fight that battle, because what if we lose? What will that do? Uh, we're not the United States, we're not Australia, where dioceses and bishops have an independent standing from the national church. The United States, when they kicked out uh, Iker and Ackerman and Duncan and all that, you know, their salary didn't end, their churches didn't disappear. In other words, there, now there are lawsuits and all this and that, but they could continue as ongoing entities. That is not possible in the Church of England. If the seven, eight, nine, ten bishops who are on the conservative side say, we disagree and we will not do this and we'll walk away, they walk away from their house, their job, their income, and there's no infrastructure for them to step into. There's no, uh, nothing they well, can slide into. Back at the time, there was only the ACN and there was not a structure for Bishop Duncan to walk into. I understand some of these bishops and clergy people who were uh, disciplined by Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and given the letter uh, lost salary and lost their pension. Yes, but by and large, the congregations and their salaries stayed yes. followed them. Uh, that's, agreed. But yeah, see, yeah. that's that is no, not in every case, not right. in every case in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. but in the big diocesan ones where the majority right. of things happen. Virginia and stuff like and that, it, absolutely. Yeah. England, that's not possible mm -hmm. because of the way the system is set up. So the voice there are saying, now's not the time to pick that battle. Now's not the time to have this fight. Let's see what we can get out of this and sort of try to kick the can down the road. And some of the arguments are that demography is on our side. Recent study came out, where are the young people who are attending the Church of England going? Are they going to these liberal churches? Are they going to these college chaplaincies? No, the big evangelical, conservative, biblical-centered churches are where the young people with children are. The dying churches with 10 old ladies, that's where the gay clergy and that's where their power bases are. Mm -hmm so that if we can hold on there will be natural selection and we will basically pull through this and have you know almost what uh, pope benedict the 16th described in his regensburg address a church uh that is uh separate and standing away from the world that has basically uh come out 
of the world. And that will happen through attrition and natural selection. We just need to hold on and not surrender everything to the enemy now. So these are irreconcilable political ideas as the way forward. And that's not a good thing for the evangelicals to be divided. But they're united on what they believe. They just don't know how to put it into effect. And that's the biggest problem here is there's not, there's no good choice. If they go to the ANIE, they can't be guaranteed a job or a church. Uh, that's that's a beginning organization that's just starting to get a foothold. And, you know, I'm hearing some good reports, but they can't take, you know, 70 clergy to see, you know, and, and mm -hmm. salary them in, and uh, give them an income. So, you know, where, where do they go? The other thing we need to understand is that uh, how the money flows in England. Mm -hmm. um, there are some mega parishes that are uh, pos where positive cash flow into the diocese occurs, that yes. they are sources of income. Most parishes in the Church of England can't pay their way. And so they don't own their property. The tr National Church does. They rely upon the National Church to pay the salary of their vicar. And should they be asked to leave, there's not a whole lot of places. It's not like, Kevin, your church could go purchase, say, an old Methodist church. Um, property, England's an island. It's a tiny yes, place compared to the United States. <laughs> what I think yeah. is England the size of Florida. I think England's the size of Florida. The size of Florida, yeah. A little larger uh, than Florida, yeah. Little, but, you know, <laughs> there are not a lot of surplus churches yet that aren't Church of England churches, so it, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult environment di and different environment, and so. Well, it's, it's also easy difficult for me. To be, they don't have enough clergy to staff the churches they have. Mm -hmm. So it, it's one of these big paradoxes that uh, you, if you want to stand in the Church of England, now is your chance, and this may be your last chance as a priest. Yeah, you know? that is what that is one view, and. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking That's the, my view. I'm, I'm taking the line that I'm not there. I don't know enough. Mm. I encourage those who want to take that stand. I, I salute their courage, but I'm also persuaded that there is some truth in the idea not to surrender the institution until you absolutely have to. You know, maybe I'm more the I'll go down with the ship rather than uh, jump into a new ship. Who knows? Well, who knows? But right now, Justin Welby is playing the the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. And I saw finally a conservative bishop stand forward, uh, Bishop Rob Monroe, and says, you know, the Church of England is at a crisis point. What? No. How could that be? I've been listening to Justin Welby and Cottrell and everybody else, and they said, it's fine. It's fine. No big deal. Rob Monroe is a newly consecrated Bishop of Ebb's fleet, and in his first newsletter, he's the flying evangelical bishop right. for the Brand Church new. of England. Yeah. Uh, and new as of a week. Um, he still doesn't have a house, an office, <laughs> he's, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still putting things together for him. I don't even think he has a secretary yet. He may. But the message he's giving is this is a bad time what do we do in other words if they go over the cliff and his answer is jesus is still lord god you know um there's a saying in the united states god loves drunks uh fools in the united states of america, america we'll always protect right. <laughs> and and uh, rob monroe is giving an english version of that uh god loves drunks fools in the church of england uh we'll see yeah. But he's basically uh, on the hold fast, let's not give in yet line. But he is well, making, he's vocalizing clearly uh, where what the issues are and what the consequences of bad action are. I find the irony in this that just uh, 15 years ago, uh, conservative priests and bishops here in America were demanding depot from Roland Williams. And not but half a generation later, the Church of England is leading the the decline and leading a change in doctrine uh, with Canon B30 uh, to, you know, assess and uh, be complementary to culture 
for all the wrong reasons. There's, there's an in- Rod Dreher is an Orthodox uh, Christian mm-hmm. Orthodox with a big capital O. Yeah, he's an uh, Orthodox writer, person. Uh, commentator, journalist. He uh, put out a story last week that really has had me thinking. I subscribe to his uh, Substack, uh, which is mm-hmm. a uh, publishing uh, medium. And he talked to a Slovakian former interior minister who during communism had been part of the underground Catholic Church. And after Benedict retired, this man, Holka Hoka, uh, I don't remember his first name, corresponded with Benedict. And one of the things Pope Benedict wrote in his retirement was that he sees signs that the age of the Antichrist is about us. And that I don't mean to be, you know, wifty and conspiratorial, but apocalyptic man, or apocalyptic, but man, um, things are going south everywhere, politically, economically, that the the institutions are failing. The things in the past that America, for instance, could look to, the integrity of the officer corps of the army, gone. Yeah. Gone. Did the generals science, lie science, to Donald gone. Trump and yeah, yeah. science, medicine, gone. the universities, Academia. the yeah. church, the press? Um, there are no, uh, I'm not, I, this is overly broad, but I can't think of any institutions which are admired as institutions they, they once were. And in all this anarchy, and, and this anarchy and chaos is worldwide. And is there any truth to Benedict's premonition that we are entering the time of the Antichrist? Well, this sort of chaos is a good indication that uh, yeah, I, we might be getting closer. I mean, if you lived in the times of Lenin and Stalin and early uh, communism and early socialism, you saw the 120 million people die, whether it be through execution or starvation uh, or just the system. And, you know, so we look back on that with the horror. Oh, my Lord, that was a bad time. But if you look at what they believed back then and what they believe now, uh, this wokeism that has, that I, I can't believe anybody uh, believes in the, the woke doctrine. And the woke is a doctrine. And what we've seen here is new cults. There is a transgendered cult. You can get in, but you can't get out. Okay, there is a woke cult. You can get in, but you can't get out. There is a new veneration of uh, certain races. And you can get into that veneration, but you can't get out. And, well, that is kind of the definition of an apocalypse, where you can not have thought beyond uh, entertaining the thought. Because once you're in, you can't get out. Do you know, we locally, we have the Walt Disney Corporation. Walt Disney was as true blue, the man, American Pie, straight laced American Pie. And now we have uh, Disney's putting out a new cartoon for children on the Disney Channel that is pushing the 1619 lie, that project about slavery being the source of America that attacks the very idea of interracial dating. You must not date outside your racial group. Walt Disney is pushing good old fashioned bans against race mixing that we thought disappeared in the 1950s with uh, Bull Connor. Um, the, uh, I don't watch the Grammys. I have no interest in that, but I've been seeing all these films about uh, rather untalented music musician named Sam Smith, rather fat, grubby, balding man, um, doing satanic worship as part of the, the Grammy. And then I saw a picture of Madonna and I got scared. Yeah. <laughs> I know vampires <laughs> exist now. No, no. In, other, I mean, in other words, where we, are our popular culture we're normalizing pedophilia. We're normalizing transgenderism. We're normalizing Satanism. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know where we're going, and I think Benedict might be right. The end times are getting closer as we speak. 
No, I did not watch the Grammys. I just saw some of the, the image clips from the Grammys. If they had done the opposite and decided, hey, we're going to venerate God or, or Christ or do something in a white encapsulation instead of red, it would have been to mock Christ. It would have been to mock what is good. Here they picked what was evil and said, meow, this is fun. This is something we can celebrate and venerate. And, you know, that's, you that's know, but the this, difference. But here's the thing, Kevin. This was passe with Kiss, you know, the music group Kiss about 30 years ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, this is not new. This is not uh -huh. interesting. It's not particularly entertaining. It. These are very dull, tired ideas. Oh, I haven't, I've have not watched. The, I, I've watched the Grammys once in the mid 80s. And that's just because I think the remote for the TV was broken. You know, back then I was the remote, so I just didn't want to get up. But yes, it's passe, but in our culture, on the whole, they still look to what is good and mock it. Our culture right now, on the whole, looks to what is, uh, feel, uh, it feels good, do it, as, yeah, you know, that's, that's not just plausible, because it does feel good for a short period. And so, yeah, it, apocalyptic times, we haven't seen the death rate of the 1920s, but when we do, I would agree with you that uh, the game is over, and you mentioned Rod Dreher, who wrote the Benedict Option, where uh, maybe as Christians we need to have a separate culture for a while while, while this thing blows over, when the, we, when the apocalypse happens, maybe that's something we end up doing. Yeah. Can, can, I, can, I, I'm listening I, in the background. I think your dog needs a CPAP. Yes, he's snoring <laughs> right now. He's lying in the sunshine from the window, snoring away. Yeah. He has a happy yeah. life. The end times are not here for Julius. <laughs> no, he doesn't care. <laughs> Is I, there a dog? Can I, raise, can I raise yeah. two viewer mail questions that have sure. been asked of us? The first is... Uh, how come we haven't talked about the Polish National Catholic Church talks with the continuing Anglican movement mm -hmm. and Bishop Chandler Holmes Jones? Jones. And the answer is because ignorance on my part. I haven't really been following it and yeah, I can't I, really I, add any. I, I mean, we go, Anglican Unscripted has in the mission to deliver. Uh, Christian and Anglican news to a large audience and uh, Chandler Jones I love him friend of the program um, and wonderful Christian wonderful Bishop uh, doesn't have would not the topics would not bring the audience that or or entertain the audience that we have the larger audience in my humble opinion I could be wrong yeah and the other thing is we've been asked to comment on the uh, COVID and the whole Pfizer business mm -hmm. and you know where according to the latest news Pfizer was fudging fudging studies and was in collusion with people and these uh, boosters actually make you sicker and the death rate and again I have to pre plead ignorance I really I made up my mind pretty on early I had the first two shots because I had to that's it yeah same here but I never got any boosters and I didn't worry about it. And I just went on with my life and paid no never mind about uh, what people said. Um, well, because I shut yeah. down once because the bishop said to. We closed for, I think we were only had worship on nine weeks in 2020 out of 52. Never doing that again. Never. Okay. It was and, just a terrible mistake. And there, where do we get the excess deaths from? We shut down. We shut down our cancer centers. We shut down our uh, cardiovascular centers. We shut down the whole health system, except for those who had COVID. So if I had a mild, uh, you know, chest pain, or uh, I thought, you know, maybe I have developed a, uh, some cardiac vascular disease of some sort, I didn't go near a hospital. And there are hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of patients who are not doing that. So we let people run afoul with diabetes because they gain weight over COVID. We let the heart uh, people go untreated. We let the cancer people go undiagnosed. And now all of a sudden 
We're starting, start, still ramping back our, our pre, uh, pre-2019 medical system, and we're surprised we have excess deaths. Well, we have excess deaths because for almost two full years, we have been under-treating the people who had access to full treatment, which is the difference because you don't see ex- excess deaths in countries who don't have a fully developed uh, healthcare system, like uh, in African countries, not seeing a spike in excess deaths because... Uh, they were always at this median because they didn't have access to advanced medical technology. Now, yeah. uh, to one viewer I wrote, because there's not a clear church angle on this, yeah. and because of my ignorance, I'm really not keen. He said, well, what about Michael Curry saying, it's a sin if you don't get that? And essentially my response is, "Nobody, I don't care what Michael Who's Curry Michael says. Curry? And, my saying, and of my saying that the presi- I don't care what the presiding bishop says about an issue, that is not earth-shattering. Because our, the way our system works, you know, he's neither here nor there, Michael Curry. In fact, Bishop Chandler Jones is a thousand times more important than any news on Michael Curry. He, Michael Curry has bottomed himself <laughs> in Anglican news. I'm sorry, he has... No, I mean, yeah. if, he marries yeah. another, if he marries another British royal, or if he <laughs> yeah, basically okay. says yeah, sure. that, you know, yeah. that the five Memphis policemen who shot Tyree... Banks, Nichols, Tyree Nichols, Nichols uh, yeah. were 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 white. <laughs> were driven by white racism. That's something. I mean, but it's I don't want to say comical, but it is in line with sort of his woke worldview. Mm-hmm. And you know, well, that's why we don't get into some topics that people are quite keen that we do, basically from ignorance and also from a lack of uh, seeing their relevance to the deeper stories. Even though what's happening in England is happening in England and will in no way impact Kevin's and my life on the ground, it's a bigger story because it is emblematic of the decline of Christian churches around the world. Because, you know, the Baptist Church in Australia is going through the same fight the Church of England is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Church went through this fight. The the Methodists are doing it right now. Southern Baptists, uh, United Methodists is split. Uh, Lutherans are, you know, going. Nobody's not going through this. The problem is they have to go through this. That doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. to me. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 788 of Anglican Unscripted.